a 2D side-scrolling platformer released for the 3DO by Crystal Dynamics in 1994. Once they realized that the 3DO was selling like dick, they soon ported it to the PlayStation and Sega Saturn in 1995 and 1996, respectively. The game's about a channel-surfing couch potato gecko named Gex who sucked into the TV and then has to find his way out. As a kid, I grew up with Gex 2 and Gex 3, and I never actually got a chance to play the first game in the series until many years later when it was released on the PlayStation Network, so because of that, the PlayStation 1 version is the version that I'll be playing. So is the game that started the short-lived Gex series any good, or should we just change the channel? Let's turn on the TV and, uh, find out. Like many PlayStation 1 games, there's a CG intro that briefly shows what little story this game has. I had just finished my usual morning routine of nude funker size. Essentially, Gex is a lazy, TV-loving guy. He was channel surfing one day, but suddenly Rez, the bad guy I guess, pulls him into the TV world. Yeah, that, that's it. That's the whole story. As you can already tell, this game is themed after television. The title screen does a solid job of communicating this with the static TV effect in the background. You can really tell they're going for like a stupid rad vibe with this character. You know, sunglasses, arms crossed, leaning against a fuzzy TV screen. As soon as you start, you'll find yourself in a miniature hub world with different TVs on it. Right off the bat, there'll only be one turned on. These TVs will bring you to the game's different hub worlds, each themed after a different television or movie genre. The first is horror themed, then there's cartoon, jungle, kung fu, and the final level, Rezopolis. Being a game about TV, I really think they could have picked some better genres. I mean, what kind of genre is jungle? Why not something like sci-fi or history? Well, whatever. Let's see how the game plays. Gex controls on a two-dimensional plane. You can move him left and right and make him duck with the D-pad. You can make Gex jump with the X button and can execute a tail bounce attack by pressing down on the D-pad in midair. This will allow you to bounce off of enemies. This might sound cool, but in any other 2D platformer you can jump off of enemies and kill them just by hopping on them. You don't need any additional move. In this game, if you're not holding down when you jump on an enemy, it won't work and you'll take damage. I'm really not a fan of this. Gex can also perform a tail whip attack with the circle button, along with being able to whip out his tongue in order to eat various power-ups with the square button. The game has various power-up balls you can eat to get a power-up, some of which include being invincible for a short time, being able to run much faster, or spitting various objects like fire and ice. The triangle button and the L2 and R2 buttons all don't do dick. Gex walks at a pretty slow pace, but you can make him run with the L1 button. You're not gonna want to run unless you really have to though, because you'll very often find yourself falling into pits or running into hazards. I feel like this game suffers from a bit of screen crunching, as the camera's a little bit zoomed too far in. Because of this, it'll cause a lot of blind spots, calling for a lot of unfair deaths or hits. Gex can also climb up walls in both the foreground and the background. This adds a level of complexity to the level design that's really nice to see. Gex controls a little bit sluggishly. It's a very slow-paced game if you're gonna get through it without dying over and over, so it's definitely a game for the patient. The visuals are okay. Gex's sprite has a 3D-ish look, much like the Donkey Kong Country games. His animations are alright overall, but in some cutscenes they can look pretty crude. Ha, that is wild. The levels and enemies, however, aren't made with a 3D look and are instead completely 2D looking. This is kind of weird. In DK Country, they applied that look to the whole game, and it looked great. Here, it's only applied to Gex, and it makes him stick out like a sore thumb. It really clashes with the way the rest of the game looks. Like many side-scrollers, there are many items to collect. If Gex collects 100 fly coins, he'll gain an extra life. Each level will involve Gex trying to find a remote control to unlock the next level, and then getting to the end of said level. I really wish it wasn't designed this way, because many times I've missed the remote and had to do the whole level over again. I don't know why they didn't make the goal just getting to the end. Adding an item to find doesn't really flesh out the experience that much, especially because half of the time the remote isn't even hidden, it's just out in plain sight. Instead, they decided to do a better job hiding the videotapes you need to get a password. You might have noticed the word password at the title screen. Yep, that's right. This game does not have a save feature. That means if you die, you go back to the title screen and have to start the entire game over. Unless you happen to be lucky enough to find a password. And you can't just access the password whenever you want. Instead, you have to find a videotape inside each level in order to get one. 
This is very frustrating, because it's very easy to miss these videotapes. You also may have noticed that I have Infinity Lives. Well, that's because I got sick of dying and going back to the title screen. They really should have added a save feature when they ported it to the PlayStation. At the end of each world, you have to fight a boss. The boss battles aren't that great. Each one has a short pattern that they'll all mindlessly repeat. Some of them also sport a level of artificial difficulty with how close the camera is, making it hard to see where the boss is before he zooms under the screen and Gex takes a hit. Being obsessed with TV, Gex will make countless pop culture references as you play the game. Three, two, let's get back to the mystery van. The majority of these aren't really that funny, and it all gets really annoying fast when you hear him say the same ones over and over again. This one's for Johnny! This one's for Johnny! In the American version of the game, Gex was voiced by a comedian named Dana Gold. He does an alright job, but with how repetitive the lines get, you'll get tired of hearing him pretty quick. I guess it would be fair to call the game's difficulty NES hard. You know, the lack of a save feature, limited lives, getting kicked to the title screen when you get a game over, that sort of thing. I suppose to some that kind of difficulty could trigger a nice bit of nostalgia, but considering the time it came out, that kind of stigma was pretty much long irrelevant. After beating the first four worlds, you'll unlock the final world, Rezopolis, which is short, but hard as hell. Once you've done the levels, you come to the final showdown with Rez, and... wait. What's this? The camera is zooming out? Why couldn't they do that for the previous bosses with a tight camera issue? Hell, why couldn't they have done that for the whole damn game? They should have at least added an option to zoom the camera in and out with the unused L2 and R2 buttons. That could have made the game leaps and bounds better. Anyway, the final battle with Rez isn't half bad. It seems as if it's the only boss battle they actually put any effort into. Once you've beaten him, you'll watch another CG cutscene showing Gex emerging from the television and back in his chair. That, that's it. Story over. Whatever. I guess a big story isn't really important for a game like this. So in the end is Gex, a good game. Uh, it's not a bad game, I don't really like it. The controls are a little bit on the sluggish side, and there's a lot of crap level design that'll cause a lot of cheap deaths. Though the game does sport enough original ideas and game mechanics to make it a fairly solid platformer. I guess if you're a fan of old-school 2D difficult side-scroller platforming games, you might want to give it a try, you might like it, but overall I wouldn't really recommend it to everybody. Despite the 3DO version selling like dick, the Sony PlayStation version of the game did sell enough copies to spawn not one, but two sequels. These games made a transition over to 3D much like Super Mario 64 did after Super Mario World. Well, hopefully Gex will fare better in the third dimension than he did as a side-scroller, so until next time, I'm gonna go watch some TV. Hey guys, thanks for watching this episode and that you're at all the way through. As always, I really appreciate it. If you thought this video was good, then why don't you go down and click that like button. And if you want to see more Nitro Rad videos in the future, don't forget to subscribe. If you want to watch some more videos I've done, you can click the one on the left, which is a review of a game called Mogeko Castle, an RPG Maker horror game. But if you want something a little more similar, you can click the video on the right, which is a review of another platforming game called Tie the Tasmanian Tiger. So, I hope to see you guys in the future, and as always, take care. Not one, but two sequels. These games made a sequel over- FUCK! These titles!